Okay, uh, let's begin. So let's sketch these three and move on, starting with A. Okay, pay attention. Uh, someone from the uh, first group, what do we do? Um, well, you can start by saying what like A, B, C, and K are. So, okay. a, a is equal to 2, B is 0, C is 0, and then K is 3. Okay. So, um, the period's 2 pi over 3, and then the period divided by 4 for graphing is pi over 6. Alright, divide that by 4, so pi over 6. Okay, what does that mean for us here? Um, so now we can graph on an x-y coordinate start. Um, so the first point would be at 0, 2, when for pi, or for, yeah. You're drawing on the x-y coordinate? Yeah, right. x-y axis? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you can do that in your head? No, they just talking about like the initial graph. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, the, the initial. Oh, but graph. the initial graph isn't in x, y. Or the uh, r theta. The initial graph is in the r theta. Oh, one. sorry. That's what I meant. The r theta one. And so it's it's theta versus r is what the initial graph is about. So then, or, when theta zero, the radius is two. Okay. But how do how do you what is the how do you actually sketch the graph here? Um. Well, you can start by. The A value tells set up your grid. So the C is 0, right, which is just the horizontal here. Mm -hmm. The A is 2, which means you want to go up by 2 and down by 2. So that's the highest and lowest points. Mm -hmm. And you can separate by um, the pi over 6 for the period by the four. Right, so... Um, if this is... 2 pi over 3, that's going to be an entire graph happening in there. So that's four sections here. But of course we have to keep copying this pretty much. Until we hit, say, 2 pi. So continue this. Let's take one more section 4 here. So you have four sections and another four sections and another four sections. Okay. So uh, how do we start labeling these? Um, so you can start. So this is pi over six, mm -hmm. two pi over six, which is pi over three, three, three pi over six, pi over two. Uh, and this would be four pi over six, five pi over six. 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6, 10 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, and 12 pi over 6. Okay? Uh, now what? Um, so, so you said 0. Two. Mm -hmm. So it starts here, and then what does it behave like? Um, and then it would go downward, so it's zero pi over six, and then negative two, and zero, two. So now zero. we're just following the pattern yeah. mm -hmm. of cosine. So these are the points it's hitting. So the graph looks like. So how do we move that over here? Um, so you start by drawing or like sketching a circle with a radius of two, because that's what it is in the first Radius two. And that's the biggest radius there, so that's two. 
And then if you look at um, the first point that we have on the r theta graph, that's 0, 2. So over here, um, you can plot the point in 0, 2. <coughs> And then, um, so then when you are moving to, to um, theta is pi over 6, um, you have 0. So it would go back to the center. OK, where is your pi over 6? On there. Like, right there, like, um, it's where. That's something you want to set up first, right? So we drew this. So you draw the circle. The second thing you're supposed to draw in is the angles. Right? So you don't even start plotting the points yet. So uh, pi over 6, of course, this angle here is 0, which is equivalent to 2 pi. Over here is going to be pi. So pi over 6 means you divide this angle into 6 pieces, So which means you divide each quarter into thirds. So each of those angles are pi over 6. These are very faint broken lines here. Okay. And that's going to be uh, your pi over 6, and your 2 pi over 6, and your 3 pi over 6, and your 4 pi over 6, and your 5 pi over 6, and your 6 pi over 6, and your 7 pi over 6, and your 8 pi over 6, and your 9 pi over 6. Your 10 pi over 6, and your 11 pi over 6, and your 12 pi over 6 at 2 pi. Okay. So now we can start to sketch in the function. Okay. Um, so then the next point you would have after, so it was the pi over 6, 0, and then next to pi so over 3. Go here to the origin. Then you have um, pi over 3, negative 2, so you would need to. Um, like move backwards, so okay. be on, so it'd be on the four pi over three. Okay, going all the way to two. Yeah, okay. two. It goes over here, and then it goes um back to zero pi over two, and then two pi over three is at two. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go here, and then back to zero for pi pi over six, and then pi it's negative two, so again you would need to go. Go yeah. that way, so you go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And then um, Back 7 to pi over 6, 0. Four and pi where are we here? Uh, 4 pi over 3, 2. Okay. So 4 pi over 3, 2. So we actually, so we're going to retrace this. Yeah, retrace that one. And come back. So it's just all going to be retracing. And then right 5 pi over 3, uh, we head in the opposite direction. It's going to retrace that. And then uh, from 11 pi over 6, now it's going to just go back to 2 pi. Yeah, so it's uh, three puddles. Okay, so that was the process. First, draw the regular trig graph in the r theta plane. Uh, you draw in all your circles, you draw in all your angles, and then you kind of follow uh, what this graph says to do. So that's what that graph. So we graphed B in class last time. Let's graph C. Two minus three cosine theta. Okay. So we first started by then all variables. So A would equal uh, three. Or negative three. Or yeah. Well, technically, you take yeah, the absolute value is, is yeah. what matters. Okay. So then um, your B. B would equal zero. C would equal two. I mean, yeah. Two. Yeah. And then K would equal one. So we knew that period would equal two pi. And so we knew that the, the graphing subintervals would be pi over two. And so we decided to graph our R and uh, theta graph. Theta versus R. Okay, what do you put in first? Amplitude. 
So we went, oh, technically vertical shift. So we went up um, okay. two spots from the... So we went up to the level of two. And then we went up and down. By three. So, so five and eight. Five, go down to negative one. <coughs> and then our subintervals would be pi over two, mm -hmm. pi, three pi over two, and two pi. Pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. And since it's a negative cosine graph, yeah. you start at the negative. You start at negative one. Start from the bottom. And then at pi over two is two. Pi would be five. Three pi over two would be two, and two pi would be negative one. So a graph that's here. Okay. And then we graphed our initial graph, or the uh, the polar graph. There's a concern here, but we'll see if we run into it. Um, so we drew uh, three circles. Mm -hmm. So one is a radius of one. Uh, one's a radius of two. And then another is a radius of five. And since the uh, we don't need to graph the um, the uh, angles because they're already given. Okay. Uh, so we just started at uh, point negative one zero. Okay. What does that mean? So here's the angle zero, which is going to the angle two pi. Oh, That's yeah. the angle of pi over two. It's angle phi. It's angle three pi over two. So starting at negative one angle zero, what does that mean? You start on the first circle, and it would be where pi is. So neg it's negative one zero, and then from there, um, it was um, pi over two, comma pi. So you'd go around the first circle to connect to uh, pi over two on the second circle. Okay, so how, how am I going to do that? Um, you go around radius one circle to connect to the point on the radius two circle. You mean like this? Yeah. Okay, and just go like this? Up until the pi over two point right there. Okay. And then you would continue that line to the radius 5. No, something is wrong. No. Oh. What's the issue here? I don't know. Huh? Huh? What? I, I don't, I just hear a lot of mumbling. What are we missing? So the beginning, we know the beginning and the end point, right? Yeah. But we don't really know much in between except that it passes through zero. It passes through zero. What does it mean uh, to pass through zero? Okay, exactly. there, hit, there, there comes a point where it passes through the origin, um, which means if I avoided this and went around here, that doesn't pass through the origin. So there's a contradiction between this graph and that graph. How do I know where it will pass the origin? <clears throat> Hitting the horizontal is an important point to know 
So those two points are actually important. You can't ignore them. Because they tell us we have to go back to the origin. There comes a point where our distance from the origin is zero. How do we actually find that? What do you mean plug in and how? Okay. Set r equals zero to find where these points are. Right? When your distance is zero, it's, a, it's an important thing to know. OK, so we would have 2 minus 3 cosine theta equals 0. How do we solve that? The arc cosine of 2 over 3. So cosine of theta would be 2 over 3. And so uh, your theta is going to be what? Well, the cosine inverse of 2 over 3. We could kind of approximate that, but uh, let's not bother. But I know that there comes a time where I have to worry about hitting zero. One of those times is cosine inverse of 2 over 3. And because of all students take calculus, I know that uh, to get a positive 2 over 3, that will occur in the first and the fourth quadrant. All I know at this point is somewhere between the angle of 0 and pi over 2, uh, we are going to hit zero. I would want to actually put that in. So. Put a point here, call that the cosine inverse of two thirds. And there's going to be another point uh, between three pi over two and two pi. Which is going to be the reference angle. That's really going to be uh, two pi minus cosine inverse. Okay, so there are these two angles here that we have to pay attention to. All right, so now what? Uh, okay, so uh, we're kind of moving in the opposite direction. There comes a point, though, where I have to come and hit zero, and I consider myself on this angle. Yeah. Okay. And then now I'm in. From there, you connect to pi over two. I'm going to radius two. So we pass over that and hit here. Then from there, you connect to negative uh, to the, the positive five. Um, you know, circle at, at pi. Uh, the circle radius five at pi. Yeah. So it comes around and goes boom. Okay. And then from there, you basically just repeat the process. So you go to uh, I guess in its opposite. Form. So you go to the radius 2 at 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 here, we're on the circle radius 2. And then you connect through the origin at the angle 2 pi minus cosine inverse of 2 thirds. And then arc through uh, negative 1, 0. So we have actually have a, a little inner loop here, and we go all the way around. And then we close that in loop. So that's what that graph looks like. This, this guy is called the inner loop. So later on, I'm going to ask you things like, find the area of the inner loop. Right, that would be the guy I'm talking about. Let's, uh, yeah, so that's what that one looks like. Uh, be careful. Moral of the story, where you hit the origin matters. Um, if you can find the exact answer, that's nice. If you can't, just write it in terms of inverse trig functions and just at least positionally know where you need that angle to be. Somewhere between 0 and pi over 2, I need something. And somewhere between 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi, I need something else. Okay? Those, those guys are going to be important. So that was this one. D. Okay. So it's actually very similar to the first one, except we shifted things up by one. Now how's that going to change things? So this is plus two cosine three. Let's see how adding a one to the first one changes things. So I think we all know how to get started off here, but uh, someone let's go. Uh, 
Alright, um, so <laughs> A is equal to 2, um, B is equal to 0, C is 1, and then the period, because K is equal to 3, the period will be 2 thirds pi. Um, but for the sake of making this easier, we said 4 pi over 6. Uh, pi this, the subintervals are pi over 6. Alright, so the period over 4 is going to die. Okay. So, now, what do we want to put in here? Um, these sub intervals all the way up to 2 pi, so they're going to be 12 pi. Uh, I probably want to put it in the amplitude first, so I know how far I'm drawing these guys. So how do I put that in? The amplitude is 2, but it is centered at 1 because of the vertical shift. So you vertical shift up to 1. Yeah. So that's the that's your new baseline, kind of, quote unquote. You would move up and down by 2 from that. So you go as high as 3. And then you go down as low as negative 1. There's going to be a graph. 2 pi over 3 basically means the, the section 2 pi. We're literally going to cut that into three pieces. Where 2 pi happens at the end here. And each of those pieces we cut into fours. pi over 6, the 2 pi over 6, the 3 pi over 6, the 4 pi over 6, the 5 pi over 6, the 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, the 8 pi over 6, the 9 pi over 6, the 10 pi over 6, the 11 pi over 6, and the 12 pi over 6. So then it's a cosine graph starting at the top. So we put the top. Right, then we hit the middle, then we hit the bottom, then we hit the middle, then we hit the top, then we hit the middle, then we hit the bottom. Okay, these guys. <coughs> Now we have a bunch of zeros, and we know those guys are important. And so let's find them before moving on. So if I set 1 plus 2 cosine 3 theta equals 0, how do I solve this? Alright, so cosine 3 theta is going to be, move the minus 1 over, then divide by 2. Okay. How do I solve for that? So your theta is going to be, so you take the cosine inverse of this guy. But of course we want more than the cosine inverse. We want all the angles between 0 and 2 pi that will satisfy this uh, of uh, one third, one third of that. So, start telling me some angles that will actually do this. <clears throat> Where does cosine uh, inverse, what, what is cosine inverse of minus that half? It's on the right side of that table, right? So, this. So, I don't, I don't, did I tell you guys this? I, I don't remember. Maybe. Probably not. 
pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. Okay, we should know. Uh, to figure out the sine coming up from 1 to 3, uh, go backwards with cosine. Okay, the square root of everybody. Uh, divide over 1 by 2. So you know cosine hits a half at the pi over 3. Right? Um, now, based on all students take calculus, uh, we know that the negative versions of that will occur over here and over here in the second and third uh, second and third quadrant, right? Because cosine is positive over here, we want the negative values, so we're looking for solutions in those two quadrants. Now, because we know it's pi over three, pi over three means you divide pi into three equal pieces, so you divide the entire pizza pie into six slices. We care about the slices that end up here and here. So uh, I know, now based on this picture, it can't even help me, but I, I could have stopped myself otherwise. I know I ultimately want six solutions. So I'm just going to keep going until I have six solutions. So uh, you could just start counting off the pi over threes. Each slice is a pi over three. 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, it's the first one. Three pi over three, four pi over three hits the second one. Five pi over three, six pi over three, seven pi over three, eight pi over three hits the third one. Nine pi over three, ten pi over three hits the next one. That's four so far. Let's keep going. Uh, eleven pi over three, twelve pi over three, thirteen pi over three, fourteen pi over three. Fifteen power three, sixteen power three. So uh, those are all my guys. So these angles will be uh, two pi over nine, comma four pi over nine, comma eight pi over nine, comma ten pi over nine, comma fourteen pi over nine. Those will be the first six solutions uh, in the positive uh, angles. So now, just just like a little vertical shift really uh, changes things, doesn't it? Um, what are the circles? Yes. Sixteen over nine. So, uh, what are the circles we draw here? Yeah? One and three. It's just one and three. So you just look at the y uh, axis, all the numbers you have there. Just take the absolute values. So we're going to have a circle of radius one, and a circle of radius three. There are two circles here. And we have a bunch of angles. Uh, all these pi's over sixes. So pi over 6, of course, means divide pi into 6 pieces, which means divide each quarter of the circle into 3 pieces. So uh, this is 0, pi over 6, uh, 2 pi over 6, 3 pi over 6, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6. Nine pi over six, ten pi over six, eleven pi over six, twelve pi over six. Uh, we also have these two angles. Uh, I hit a zero between pi over six and pi over three. So there's another angle here that I care about. I in fact know that that angle is going to be two pi over nine. I will hit another one between pi over three and pi over two. 
uh, and that was uh, 4 pi over 9. I'll hit uh, 0 between 5 pi over 6 and pi. That's going to be 8 pi over 9. And I will hit between pi and 7 pi over 6. 10 pi over 9. And I will hit somewhere between 3 pi over 2 and 5 pi over 3. And that will be 14 pi over 9. And I will hit somewhere between 5 pi over 3 and 11 pi over 6. That will be 16 pi over 9. That's, yeah. Um, like why? Do you have to know the angles? Uh, you mean natural value? Yeah, because like if you're sketching mm -hmm. and you just know that, so like, like once we start sketching and we start at um, three, and then at pi over two we're gonna be at one, and then if you just know that you have to pass the origin before going to the next angle mm -hmm. value, you won't you still get the same? Um, Curve. Yes, which makes it a great question. Why go through the trouble, right? right yeah. um, because sketching is never going to be the only point. Like, sketching would be something you do on your way to solve another problem. Uh, and the angles might be important for that other problem. So it's better just get out of the way. So it's better just get out of the way. Right. So if, if I were just to ask, oh, just sketch, the, sketch this curve and that was it, then, it would have then just, yeah, just write some theta 1 here, some theta 2 there. So I know it's going to hit 0 there. Uh, but usually I'd more to ask you to do something else, like find the area of something or find the length of a curve between two points and the point where you hit the origin might matter in that situation. So you'd have to actually need to know what the actual moment is. Okay. So if, if you ever need to know it, this is how you go through and do it. Um, but yeah, if sketching alone was the point, you wouldn't technically need to know. Um, you wouldn't even need to know what any of these numbers are actually. You just know I'm slicing up the circle in this equal amount of pieces. Right? I'm slicing up the entire two pi into 12 equal pieces. Like technically, I don't need to know what all the pieces like are. One, two, three, four, five, I could just know I split each of these into threes yeah. and then put some lines in between these. I don't need to number any of these. So if the sketching is the only thing that matters, then you don't need to find the angle. But usually it's not. I'm actually going to ask you something else where you're going to use the sketch to help you do that other thing. So that's why we need to be go through the trouble here. Anyway, let's uh, finish this guy up. Now, this one isn't a test question because this would take forever, but uh, uh, it's good to keep our concentration up on a longer type problem. So where do we start here? On the circle of radius 3 when we are at the angle 0. And then, pi over 6, we're going to jump to the circle of radius 1. Then I'll pass through 0 on this little slice here. Sorry. And you're going to go to 4 pi over 3 at 1. Right, so that's pi over 3. I want to go to the opposite. And then you're going to go up to 2 pi over 3. Right. And then you're going to go to 3 at 3. Or sorry, first you're going to pass through. What is this? Mm -hmm. I have to go back to 0 first. Yeah. So I just do a little loop when I come back. Okay, so that now I'm here. <laughs> Next stop is the circle of radius 1 at the angle pi over 2. And then you have a circle of radius 3 at 2 pi over 3. And then back down to 1 at 5 pi over 6. And then 0 at 8 pi over 9. Mm -hmm. And then negative 1 <coughs> pi. So at pi, so we are going the other way. way. So we're going uh, over here. Back to yeah. 0 at 10 pi over 9. Wait, isn't no, that? You, you, wait, you, you're supposed to be here pi, so it's stay it's long. Not, not pi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm supposed to go opposite way of pi. Okay, so there it's so come back. Scared a little bit here. Geez, even the ink is running out. This is not right. Okay. So now we're at zero. Which one of these zeros are we at? Uh, this one, right? Yeah. Okay. So now seven pi over six, circle of radius one. One. Then to the circle of radius five and four pi over thirty. Mm -hmm. And then back to one at three pi over two. And zero at fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, fourteen pi over nine. Mm -hmm. Just lost myself. <laughs> <laughs> Negative one at five pi over three. Okay, so five pi over three is here. I'm going uh, backwards here. Back to zero. Yeah. Back to zero. And then back to the or no, then you go to the next one to that. Eleven pi over six. Yeah. I'm on the circle of radius one. And then you go back to one. And then I go back there. So I have like three three petals and then I have three little petals inside each petal. It's, uh, Come up with the xy equation. <laughs> like, no. no. And I would be like, find the area inside one of the big petals that's outside one of the little petals. Like, that could be something I could ask you. And for you to do that, you have to actually know the angles. So, now that we're past the easy stuff, let's get to the interesting stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding. What well, kind of? Let's actually do calculus though. I mean, that was literally just the algebra of polar terms. Like, that's how you graph a function. This is what it means. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so calculus with polar points. Now, this part actually isn't going to be bad because what you have to what you're going to realize is that uh, the way you set up polar coordinates, it's pretty much set up like a set of parametric equations. So we can think of polar coordinates computationally as defining So, uh, remember we had x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. This is how we set these up. So, in other words, you can just think of x as a function of theta and y as some other function of theta. This is just me defining my x and y in terms of some other variable. The, so, the parameter here is theta. Theta is the parameter, which means uh, if given a polar graph, given a polar curve r equals f of theta, we can find dy dx, the slope is in our xy universe, by, well, we know that that's dy d theta over dx d theta. Because it was dy dt over dx dt. So this means the dy dx is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to theta of r sine theta. But here my r I'm thinking of as a function. It's like when, I, or before I was telling you, r equals some function of theta. Uh, so this is going to be r times sine theta divided by the derivative with respect to theta of r cosine theta. So, of course, now you have to use the uh, product rule because these are both functions of theta. So I'm going to differentiate the f, uh, leave the sine, plus leave the f, differentiate the sine, divided by... Uh, 
differentiate the f, leave the cosine, plus differentiate the cosine, leave the f. So I can use that as my dy dx. So that's how we find the derivative. And of course, uh, some usual things apply here that I'd rather not write down, but I'm going to write down because now I've made a big deal out of it. Uh, uh, we have a horizontal tangent line. Basically, everything I said for parametric equations still applies here. Uh, horizontal tangents, line tangents occur when your dy d theta equals zero, but your dx d theta is non-zero. Uh, vertical tangent lines occur when your dx d theta equals zero, but your dy d theta not equals zero. And of course, if both are zero, we can use L'Hopital's rule. So all those things uh, still apply. Uh, we also can do, and of course the second derivative is you're going to take the derivative of whatever answer you got here divided by the derivative of x. So d squared y dx squared, if necessary, is going to be the derivative with respect to theta of the answer that you had here. Uh, y dx over the dx d theta. So that will also apply. What else did we do for calculus? Length of curves, I think. Length of a polar curve. R equals f theta. So we know Recall for the parametric curve. X equals x of t, y equals y of t, L equals a b, the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. Uh, gives length on the interval where t is between a and b. Similarly, I can use that formula to find the length of a polar curve. of the square root of x prime of theta squared plus y prime of theta squared theta. And this is going to be, usually they don't, if you know that formula, that will be fine. Usually they simplify it a little bit. Um, so this is going to be, remember the x we think of as some function r cosine theta, but our r is some function f. So I'm going to differentiate the f, leave the cosine, plus leave the f, differentiate the cosine. I'm going to square that. Then I'm going to here differentiate the f, leave the sine, plus leave the f, differentiate the sine. I'm going to square that. So this is going to be f prime squared cosine squared minus 2 f prime f cosine theta sine theta plus f squared sine squared theta plus f prime 
squared sine squared theta minus plus t, we've got the prime f cosine theta sine theta plus f squared cosine squared theta. Uh, what you realize is these two guys would cancel out. These two guys, you can factor out a common f prime squared. You'd be left over cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. So that actually simplifies to <coughs> f prime squared. And here, you can factor out a common f squared. You'd be left over sine squared plus cosine squared. So that would leave us with uh, f squared. which we often affectionately write in the following way. Um, uh, the f prime, we'd write that as dr d theta. Of course, we're going to square that. And the f is just the original r. So this is r squared. So we usually write it like that. So this means that l equals this guy r squared plus dr d theta squared radical d theta gives the length of the polar curve. r equals f of theta or <coughs> theta between a and b. So that's that, uh, but it's really just the same parameter equations formula that I just plugged in my polar coordinates equations and simplified. So that's how you'd find a length. So we know how to differentiate, we know how to find the second derivative, we know how to find the length of a curve. Here's something else we need to know, area. And by the way, like these a's and b's, these are actually theta values here, which is why sometimes it's important to know the angles. Uh, specifically. <clears throat> and I'll just introduce the error. We'll do examples next time, but these are the forms we're going to use next time, and that would wrap up uh, to our coordinates. Although, uh, to get through all these, the examples I have planned might take the entire next class. So the entire next class, we're still going to be doing polar coordinates. I'm just going to apply these forms that I'm deriving now. Let's look at area, not with blue. So, uh, let's say I have some polar curve, so r equals f of theta. Uh, how you measure area is very different here. There is no, no thing along the x-axis by which we're going to measure the area under the curve. Area is actually measured in terms of theta, and theta is just an angle that's going around here, which means there could be one angle, call that theta 1, and it's opening until some other angle, call that theta 2, and I care about the area of this thing. So how can we figure that out? Well, we're calculus. There's always one way to figure this out. Slice it up into little things that we know how to deal with and use a Riemann sum to add it up to get the thing. That's the calculus way of thinking. That's literally um, what calculus is about. I know we do a lot of formulas, but ultimately calculus is about the infinitesimal and the fact that we can add up a bunch of little things to get a big thing. That's kind of what calculus teaches you. That's the calculus way to look at the world. The infinitesimal. Okay, so what we can do is we can actually slice this thing into some that we know how to find the area of. For example, sectors of some circle. So we slice into a bunch of these things. Okay, so now you look at one particular sector. Uh, you define each sector, give each sector a radius, call it say r1 or r sub i for the i radius, right? So I just define this r1, r2, r3, r4 going on. And there's going to be a change in theta. So call it d theta, call it delta theta, because we're looking at. And then we know 
or hopefully we recall, uh, the area of this sector is one half r squared times the angle. That's how you find the area of a sector in radians. And radians is what we work with in calculus. So uh, basically, so the area of this piece is going to be that. And so the total area is just going to be us integrating that from the theta 1 to the theta 2. So we're going to sum up all things that look like this. The delta theta is going to be our d theta guy sticking out, out here. And we would have 1 half r squared as the function here. Where r, you replace that with your function of theta, whatever I tell you r is. So this gives us that the area, uh, theta 1 to theta 2, of 1 half r squared d theta. It's the area. By the polar curve. Uh, theta to theta one and theta two. We can generalize this just like how we have error between curves. You can have error between polar curves. Let's say I have one polar curve, uh, call that big R, and you have some other polar curve, call that little r, and I want to find the area in between them. Then it's kind of as you would think, you find the area of the bigger one minus the area of the smaller one, so very naturally, I'm not going to write down any proof for this. Uh, the A area is going to be uh, 1 half times the big R squared minus 1 half times the little R squared. Two theta 1 and theta 2. Or you can write it as 1 half times the integral of 2 theta 1 and theta 2. The big R squared minus the little R squared, where you're taking the functions. Big R is the function that is farther away from the origin, and the little r is the function that is closer to the origin. So that's how we find the error between two polar curves. So I thought I sent out an email about this, but apparently some people didn't get it. I don't know. So we do have a quiz tomorrow. We should have had one last week. So none of this calculus stuff is going to be there that I just mentioned. But you should know how to graph something. You should also know things like x equals r cosine theta, x equals r sine theta. Um, I think I'll make the bonus on just some basic hyperbolic function stuff. Know how to differentiate cinch? Do you know what the graph of tanch looks like? Do you uh, know what is the definition of cosh and cinch? Do you know that cos squared minus cinch squared equals one? I basically things like that I'll test you on. Um, but yeah, that. and I think that's the time. Yes. The polar coordinates, the graphing part. The graphing part, basically. Sketching and just knowing the general formulas that are on there.
x equals r cosine theta equals r sine theta. If I ask you, okay, here's a coordinate in x, y, could you find the coordinate in r theta or vice versa? Things like that. Yeah, so it's every other week starting this month. Okay. So we won't have those. Yeah, no.